Um, but it's interesting because why do people think this is interesting? What does it say and what does it show of our needs to actually have another perspective on the city and perhaps the right for the artist to actually do something with the city in a kind of super desperate attempt to go against normality every day and go against the grain of the logic. So I thought I, I, I'd show that as a, as a kind of, in, in, our, in our history of what we've been doing with this project, which is called Metropolis, which has been lasting for now seven years, but actually it's, it's longer than that, the way we have worked in, with, and despite our public space. And it seems to be a work which comes back and back as something which we think is really important. One of the things it also says is that who is the public? And do we even call you the public? Because the people who are there are there. No, they're not the public, they're citizens. And so as soon as you work in public space, your definition of actually who the people are you're connecting with must change, because it's their space. It's the city's space. It's the citizen's space. You are in their space. They own the space. So you cannot call them public, because as soon as you get away from defining something as a work, a piece, but as an integral element in something they experience in the every day, actually the meaning of the work, what of the work, piece of art, and the meaning of the phrase you might say piece of art, the meaning of you might say that being defined as public protagonist or artist actually disappears. <coughs> because if you keep that role play, playing on, it actually limits how people can act and react. And it limits also to the kind of response you're hoping to get out of the situation. Because in a way, we're not trying to just entertain them, we're trying to change the city. We're trying to change the views of people. We're trying to change people. So if you're trying to do this and you hold them fast in a kind of, you know, a experiential uh, terminology of experience and of um, you know, liking it, loving it, whatever, it really does question <coughs> whether that's what it's all about. So now we can put the lights on again. So that was one of them. Um, and so I was going to just backtrack from that. And, and as I said, my, all my PowerPoint and my stuff. So I did some handmade um, PowerPoints. And I can show them five at a time. And um, this is the history of street theatre in, uh, in, in Canada. What it is to draw. So you're getting my sort of a you know, pretty good map. Um, and um, what it is, it gives a, a particular. Right. One, two, three, four. Okay, fine. Anyway, um, in a way, it's quite it's quite simple. I think we all know the story, and this is one way of presenting the story. Uh, there are other ways of course as well. But but just as way in a way, how we came out of the black box in the theatre, and and how we got to that sort of artistic landscape which we know now. In a way, I mean, this is this is where it all kind of started, which you kind of know what it is. Um, and what we did, we just moved outside the doors, but we kept, kept the same relationships basically. I mean, we didn't have the walls, but we had the mental walls, and we had the cities that surround, and we still had a stage and, and that communication, we still had a back wall basically. Um, and that kind of, kind of you know, developed a little bit more, and perhaps we got into some sort of a, you know, sort of more of an arena kind of situation, but basically the same, the same, the same concept. One, two, three. And, um, and, and at some point, the back wall started to give way for you know, position and pieces in, in stuff which was really. I mean, if you go to the Palais de Park, I mean, you not know, have exactly that. You have, you have actually a very classical way of setting up, but you have this beautiful sort of uh, background. You have in Edinburgh, you have in Salzburg, you're having all these beautiful cities in which the backdrop was supposed to be, you know, quite fantastic, and you were right, and promoted and shot, and whatever. So that, you know, that was kind of sacrifice. Um, and then um, the next step was from that was, was basically that one started to sort of uh, um, to, to, to decompose this kind of formal structure around, around this, you know, the, the logics of the stage and the communication of the stage. So the next, um, one, two, three, four, five. So the next uh, thing, you know, that, that happened was one, to <laughs> not very 
serious. It's not very academic, is it? It's not very <laughs> 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 would not get it. I would not get our PhD in this. I would barely get my BA for this. But anyway, <laughs> take a while, I guess. Um, so, so this is, uh, and then it got kind of into kind of a, a circusy thing, in which, you know, one rediscovered this, because um, this, because this is very popular in the fifties and sixties. This kind of outdoor theatre is very much like staging the restaging the city again. And after the after the calamities of the Second World War and so on, uh, all these historical cities had big festivals and stuff. And this was their way of empowering the beauty of European civilization once again, although it's quite a hollow kind of uh, you know, beat. Uh, but anyway, after a time, you know, late sixties, seventies. It started, and maybe eighties, maybe even so. It started to become into kind of a, a, a you know, more of a more of a sort of populist kind of thing, and it became more of a sort of circus menagerie kind of thing. You know, there was no stage; it was a mixed public. There was no seating, there was no payment. It became very, you might say, democratic in a way, and it started to be a bit more interactive. I mean, you know, you play with the kids on the first row, you throw the balls and stuff like this. So this is that kind of that that kind of level. Then, uh, then things started to move, you know, you had this whole circle of um, a parade kind of um, events which was particularly driven by the, you know, it's the comedians, it's the Spanish, it's the Italians, particularly also the Southern French which were driving that whole thing about, actually started to move in the city, started to move from the city and look at it as a kind of a, you know, an ongoing parade. And this of course is linked to another, other traditions which can be rituals, celebrations and stuff like this, kind of very folk-based and very ethnic-based you know, things which are going on. But then the first idea of not plazas and situations, but streets. Streets for the movement, streets for the normal people, streets for the shops. And so you actually have these huge parades established through these streets and like waves of waves of colour going through and quite exotic in their in their in the way of presentation. I mean there are lots of representations of big puppets and you know colourful colourful things and stuff like this. So this was a very popular way to go, and what I, what I write here, <laughs> soft engagement and identification, soft engagement, populist, <laughs> okay, whatever, um, anyway, this was in situ, and this was the, the, maybe the real public, the public who were on the street, the public who were not paying, the public who were not privileged, and these became, so you might say, relocated in the, in the city and side for the first time, think about which points of action, which scenes could take place where. So it became more of a, a dramaturgy which was kind of put into the framework of the city. And then one started to start slowly look at well, what actually does the city offer as to points of reference which could be used in the dramaturgy. So it wasn't just a question of a, you know, the space, it was a question of a tower, it was a question of a corridor, it was a question of a whatever. And this became sort of gradually more and more related to, in a, only in a, in a symbolic way. We're talking about symbolic actions and we're talking about things which are very, very, um, you might say, architect architecturally or design-wise or whatever. So it's still very visual, it was still very superficial. One started to actually interact. And then there's a whole wave of stuff which was basically, basically in the 90s, which came to, yeah, but what about the places in between? You know, all the alleys, all the, all the, all the desolate car parks, all the rooftops, all these strange sort of non-places, as we call them. Places which are in between, which are anonymous, because the places were sought here were the places which kind of the images were well known. I mean, you were glorifying it. You know, it was the cathedral kind of stuff. You were glorifying it, and you were playing up to the glory of the city, the positive vibes of the city. In the 90s, you had this really, for the first time, you started to look at, you know, the backyards, the, the streets, the dirt, the, the, the broken, the broken uh, factories and stuff like this. And this became more and more interesting as a kind of an anti- you know, a, a, a sort of anti-authoritarian kind of take on, on, on where street theatre uh, would be, or should be at that time. So, that was the next series. So, In a way, um, in a way, there's another. Yeah, yeah okay. it gets a bit complicated. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's another. There's another. There's another movement which also 
kind of originated at the same time, which is kind of um, generally, generally, uh, you might say the, the era of the big ensembles, the era of the big productions, kind of decreased in uh, after 2000 pretty abruptly. I mean, there's a huge change in how production is thought and how one could survive in the artistic realms. And about 2000, particularly 2005, things started to be downscaled an awful lot. I mean, you find these huge, big circus productions we travel around with our chaos and stuff. Huge, big theatre productions we travel around as well. They kind of their time was beginning to be at the end, and one started to find other kind of things. And there's also another thing: is the whole merging of perhaps the visual arts and the whole performance, the whole performance genre, which has theatre but also visual arts. And visual arts are very much about the, you know the, 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 the alone artist. So a lot of the projects which were made at this time, which really came to the, the forefront were with solo artists and, the, the, and this act of walking, engaging with the city as a lone person. And the whole new rhetoric came about how do people, how do individuals engage with the city, with urbanity. It really became a sort of a, a really, really important issue and refinding the city, renegotiating with the city, reconnecting with the city on a very, very individual level. So this whole thing about actually walking and tracking and sensing the city and connecting to it in another way very receptive, you might see, receptive, and not so much about producing something, but actually exploring. This whole idea of exploring, in another way, the city. So this was another, you might say, another, another way of, you might say, deconstruction of the city. Um, also, it's a private narrations and things like this. I mean, these are very, very... Uh, um, then, uh, then something we found was also, was also interesting, one of the first metropolis about this, about inhabiting temporary spaces, inhabiting temporary rooms. Mm -hmm. Hotel rooms, uh, it could also be, um, what have I written here? Mm, empty shops, libraries, uh, car parks, uh, <coughs> stores, car washes, all this kind of thing. It's kind of, these, these, these kind of inhabiting places and creating narratives around, around them became a sort of a, a fad of the, of the, you know, up until from 2005 to 2010, there's a whole lot of work uh, produced on that. And then this is very much about the, gl the globality of the city, because these places are anywhere. A car wash is a car wash, a hotel room is a hotel room, and these are built into chains and the shops are shops. So this is really about the globality of the city. Um, and it was really about how to negotiate that and how to, how to, how to make narratives in places which were almost impossible, which didn't have a trace of a story or a life behind. The hotel rooms are cleaned. The car wash is clean. There's nothing there. So there's nothing there. So how do you actually engage with these kind of places? Both are these kind of anti-urban kind of you know philosophy about how to try to find a way through this 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 increasingly uh, this increasingly difficult urban kind of landscape which was being created. Um, after this thing with walks, uh, I, I call it parallel experiences. Uh, walking, walking, and the parallel experiences, of course, you can say, well, actually, that's the, that's digital, and that's the, you know, that's the, that's the, that's the, that's the, that's the phone. That's also just listening to podcasts and whatever. This idea of actually that the city is one level, and people became fascinated by these novel experiences of walking, seeing, feeling, touching, but actually the audio track was somewhere completely different. So you're actually on two levels, if not three levels, when you're actually experiencing something. So this could take you to another place and interact with other things. And the, actually the whole choreographing of this kind of walking thing became actually also either guiding or actually creating meeting points at which there might be exchanges or not exchanges of information or whatever. So this began to be a kind of a, the beginning of what you might call the gaming philosophy. Actually how to construct games in cities and how to work with games. But this, was, this is pre-gaming in a way. It's still very, it's still very, you might say, physical, it's still very simple. But then you do have the gaming, you know, the whole social media platforms in which there is really, really a matrix, a labyrinth, a labyrinth of possibilities, and which is actually more and more turned over to actually the content would be generated by the people taking part. So this period was still very much controlled, you know, controlled, um, uh, controlled timelines, controlled sound anyway. And uh, it was very much about just the occasional thing. And this became a very complex thing about how then do you curate on several levels at the same time and create this kind of almost group experience in which the group was being, like, say, you might say, mm, what we call it? Mm, I don't know, I'll start somewhere else. Anyway, 
And this became very much about the locking of the, as, 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 as written in protocol later on, you know, this, this whole idea of the, um, mm, the reality and the, and the fictional, or the documentary, or the docu, you might say, art wave, of how much of this was actually, you know, documentary and real, and how much it actually was fiction. And you never quite knew in these kind of things what was what. It didn't matter anyway. It didn't matter anyway if it was real or if it wasn't real or if it's fiction or fiction. It didn't matter anyway. But it did in the fact that it started to also, you might say, build up a kind of more of a consciousness about how the city is layered and how its density and how actually it, 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 uh, it, 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 it in, in impacts on the individual and how much individuals then also can impact on the on the city in that sense. So this is this is and this is the gaming thing. I mean there are there are many I mean, performance companies who have this kind of gaming thing, whether it's refugees and you run through the streets and you act as though you're trying to get to the end, or whether it's uh, looking at uh, regeneration and uh, areas or conflict zones or liminal zones they're called in the city, in which you have a period of mapping, in which you have a period of game design in which you find your spaces, you find your participants, and you play out your role. And you do this, so this becomes the first time, becomes very much close to what you might call urban planning or design. I mean, this is almost going into actually, really going into urban planning. Because what you're saying here is, this is the experiential thing and it's still a performance, but here you're changing it that it does have an end purpose. You really are trying to understand something to make able somebody to make some decisions to change that state. So here you are really starting to negotiate and really starting to try. Before that, you have to do the mapping. You have to find which participants and you have to have, a might say, a, a scenario which makes sense. So this is really into changing the city through artistic practice, through gaming practice, whatever, through role playing, whatever. But it is still an experience, but you will understand that you are part of a laboratory. You are part of a laboratory which is going through this and you're, you are participating in actually a changing process in those neighbourhoods and whatever. <coughs> I mean, there's also another, there's also like a parallel, we know all this is like narrative, like, like you know, day one to, to day 30, or, or year one to year 30, but there's another thing which is also more and more creeping into stuff, and particularly back to Remedy Protocol, which I seem to mention a lot, but, but you know, the way of actually, is that it does, it's not just with the audio work, but their way of using film, their way of using uh, another fictional layer of actually their whole, this whole cargo, cargo Sophia project, which was this truck driving through Europe, and then it's, then you had this layer inside the truck, you could look at the film, you could hear the sound of the truck drivers who were speaking Romanian and Bulgarian and talking about their travels through Europe. You could look at the outside, you were not quite sure if the outside was the outside or if it's just a film, or the people outside were not part of the radio thing you were listening through through the cab. So you really got uh, disconnected, but you were connected into this globalization. There's also American companies who've done this kind of thing, with a lot of working with, uh, with, uh, with media. So this thing that actually the media expands not just to unsettle you with regards to where you are, but to link you with other realities in this kind of urban thing. As they say, cities are, uh, you might say, or the urban condition is, is global, so why not use that? There was another movement which kind of left, when I left the, uh, which, which is like, it actually should be joined on to something earlier, um, you might say more or less this street theater looking at the, the city. Some groups then decided to work very much more in the community. And so not looking at uh, going out of the, the main, you might say, um, the city centres and the parks and whatever, but actually going into the community. And that is a start of perhaps a far more interactive way of 
engaging with the with the city, and firstly looking at you know looking at the people who live there and, and working with them. This is probably usually residential areas and so on, but actually um, say is that public space? Probably not actually. That's a territory which probably has its own rules, its own protection, and its own codes of conduct, and its own finances. So whether you say it's public space, yes it is if you look on the map, the question is whether you have the right to go there and what you have the right to do. These are negotiated spaces. You have to negotiate to actually function there. You have to negotiate to get the support, and if you have to negotiate to get the information, it's not just freely available. And you have to build credibility, and you have to build trust, and all these kinds of things. So when we say it's public space, it's a questionable thing. But of course it is public space, looking, and you, you, you want to engage in it. But it's actually, it's actually a very protected space. So these, these pr processes of legitimization, of relationships, of knowledge sharing, process of co-creation, and whatever, are really, really important. Again, these kind of processes, which I guess many of them are, are involved in, are really interesting, and it's again very much into this, you might say, urban planning narrative, or the, or the urbanist narrative, which isn't maybe planning, but maybe sort of action kind of planning, about wanting to really and put theatre or art at the centre of any community change. So that I think is really important. So, then there's another thing I'd just like to, to, to point out because I didn't know if they're going to be here as Cantabula. Contabula from Volume Ball have also got a thing which is you know we talk very much about site specific or site sensitive or site based work. They talk very much about the human specific um, um, approach, which I think is really nice and actually does uh, just take, take us somewhere else. But the idea of actually what you're trying to do is to set up meetings or you set up um, transactions or you're setting up narratives, often between small groups of people within a larger context. And that larger context has, of course, a, a dramaturgical frame, it has often a, a physical frame, but within that, there's a, there's a great deal of freedom to be able to negotiate and renegotiate of who you are, why you do things, and, and what happens. So this kind of free space of actually trying to formulate a way of being together, which is not the way we are usually together. So this is coming into the realm of something which I think is really, really important, increasingly important. Is this sense of, <clears throat> I mean, if you look at, if you look at, um, who I put, I put in Signa, do you know her? The company, Paul? and if you look at Sisters Hope, which is a Danish company, they kind of work the same way. They create what I, what I really believe and I really think are macrotopias. Now this, this theory of microtopia is, 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 is really becoming quite important because what it, what it says is that, or what it, what it denotes or what it symbolizes, is that what we're trying to do with our works, we're trying to create immersive frameworks in which we can explore other ways of being together, basically. So this becomes a kind of a, a, a way to visualize, a way to think about alternative futures, alternative societies, alternative structures, alternative morals, alternative ethics. So what they're doing, they're actually building a framework where these things can be explored. And there are rules, there are regulations, there's very strict uh, roles, there's very strict terminologies and whatever. You have to sign up for that. You have to almost, in some cases you do, you make a contract. You actually say, yes, I'm going to allow myself to be part of this for a certain number of time. It's usually not under 24 hours, maybe even longer. So in a way, in a way, and you're together with probably people you've never seen in your life before. Um, so in a way, and these microtopies are, are really, um, <clears throat> I think, interesting because there are more and more companies who start designing their work in these kind of almost, um, <coughs> could be used to spaces like this. But also they're very scenographic. They're very, um, they're very much based on, on, on senses. And they're very much based on also having to share to do things to survive. I mean, actually, the nitty gritty of eating together, sleeping together, uh, washing together, and doing stuff together. It's not just about, you might say, um, enjoying one's other company and doing 20 minutes and we touch each other and roll over and, and say it was nice and relax off or something. It really is about trying to, trying to find out how you possibly can build other kind of communities. 
So that will come back to some of the, some of the videos. But this is really where I'd kind of uh, like to end up, I think it's that. Um, and in those kind of, in those kind of, no, actually it should have been like this. See? <clears throat> because if you're working in, um, if you're working in these kind of, you might say, I would say more conflictual and more open spaces, because we must understand that when we, when, when we say no to the white cube or, or the black space and move out into the public space, it is not just something we present the work. It is something we have to inhabit. We have to inhabit. We are, we have to put, we are putting our practice in the public space. We are putting our practice in the public space. So we have to actually design our whole practice in the public space, or the public domain, or the public media in the public eye. So in a way, we are very much changing about how we have to work. It's no use saying we're still theatre built and we still have our theatre and we can go out and do shows there. I mean, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter at all. But I think this commitment of actually going and sharing the everyday, building your work up in the space, building your work up based on relationships, has another totally other, you might say, potential of change and potential of not just audience development as a sort of narrowly defined, but actually putting art in a different context in relationship to it, with society, putting it at the core of where it is. And it goes back, goes back to an old phrase which I've used for 30 years, but it's still relevant, people still don't understand it, but, um, and it's called uh, cultural acupuncture, um, and it's actually trying to find those points in any system which you can address quite simply, and which you know will connect and have repercussions, which is far greater than the input you give them. We're all wanting to know where to do a certain act at a certain time in a certain situation. So this is, this is where I come to the conclusion that it's not site-specific, it is situation-specific. So we are working more and more situation-specific, understood there is a time and place for anything or everything. But it's time as well as its place and it's the way you do it. So it's situation specific, which may be good at one point to do something, it may be completely wrong to do something at another time. And it's the understanding of that flow of energy and that flow of, you might say, <coughs> existing drama or existing conflict or existing unrest or existing social whatever, that you need to have that understanding to be able to do stuff like this. So in this process, actually the the production of the work is, of course, core and important, but it comes kind of midway through the process in which you have to start with a kind of a, I'd say, a mapping of the place. You have to know, what are we talking about? It's not a site, it's not a, it's not a, a space, it's not a territory, it is a place. And place means, place is, you know, he, he's never been able to define what a place is. What just knows that it's very, very layered that it's very different, it changes all the time, and you can't control it. So this sense of place, which we often talk about, is very, very ambiguous. Um, but anyway, this mapping of place, and then somehow the understanding of this must actually generate a kind of idea of what is needed in this place, what makes sense in this place, what would give a greater meaning, what would leave something behind. And then there's artistic research, and there's visions, and there's meetings about would this be of any use to you and how would you do it? And then the work splits into, you might say, the participatory, the local and the artistic, and then you meet to actually do the production and the presentation. But what all of this is interesting before the presentation, which is there, there's an afterlife which is maybe even more presentation of the kind of work we're, we're talking about. What happens there after the work is presented? In theatres, the, the, you know, the, the room is cleaned, you go away, and it is still, it is still essentially, you might say, a private experience. If you're doing something in the public, in the public space, it, it, it is not private, partly because there are far more people who see it, especially if you do the creation and the thinking and the development in the public space, but also because every time you go there, revisited, your mind has changed. It's, still, it's, a, com it's a compounding narrative. So you are actually not just experience something as a work of art. You are, you, are, you, you are generating part of the history, the narrative of the city. You are writing the history of the city. You are adding to those narratives, that complexity, those experiences, which are essentially social, 
and people will talk about them in a very different way than you are than you would be doing otherwise. So that really makes it really, really important to understand you have to be then committed to this common narrative. Are you going against the existing narrative? Are you trying to develop your own? Are you being sarcastic? Or are you being a protagonist? Or are you being whatever? What are you trying to do with the existing narratives? And how are you positioning yourselves with them? And who knows that? And what, do you, what are they going to do about it? And can they use it for anything? So this doesn't mean to say that you have to be you know, sort of utilitarian, have a plan of this has to change, that has to change. But you have to be very aware that this afterlife, this afterlife is where the added value of actually um, working in the public space comes in in the long term. So that was my brief history of. Uh, <laughs> now, so I thought what we do now is you have five minutes break because a couple of you have fallen asleep, and uh, if you don't, if you don't open your eyes, we will go outside. Um, so, do you want just two minutes break, or do you want to talk about what I've said? Does anybody want to say anything? I have a question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <clears throat> this was very fascinating, and I'm, I'm really glad I, I was able to hear it. <laughs> because it cleared many, many, many different things in my mind. Uh, but uh, you're saying that it changes the city. Yeah. You were saying that, especially in the first half, that later on this somehow disappeared from the book. I mean, it was not so right in the end. But I'm just uh, wondering, uh, what do you mean by that, that it changed the city? I mean, is this something palpable, or is it just something about, at the end, you said about talking uh, about the afterworks, or how? I think it can be very, on, on many levels. Um, I, 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 yeah, I made a statement that, that said once that, um, that all the work we have, and basically since 1980, we've always done lots of, uh, you might say, actions in the city. Opened up new places, um, um, made almost demonstrative actions against things happening or whatever. So this has been a, um, a lifelong practice. And I, get, I, I guess, I, I guess, I'm guessing, let's say half a million people, maybe a million, have seen those things. So if I don't think that my changing, if I don't think that, the, the, you know, that, 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 that what these people experienced in that time matters, I would have great, a, a, a great trouble thinking what am I using my time for. Um, <laughs> but, but, but I have, the, the amazing thing is, is through time, lots of people come back and say, actually, I never knew that place existed. Actually, I've never seen it. I've never thought of it like that. Or actually, I never thought we could do an event like this there without it getting demolished. Or actually, all these kind of things. And we, the best example is I wanted to show you the video later on. Um, our a chief architect has been chief architect for eight years and she's on our board. And uh, one, when she came to her first meeting with the board, she says, Yeah, I remember when I was a student, uh, I used to go to your events and it changed, it changed my understanding of what architecture in the city is. And she became chief architect. Of course, that's empowered her to do different things. So, so yes, I think it does. I think on the level of if you're going to change the city, you first have to change the people. Because we're not in the business of tearing buildings down, building motorways, uh, subways. We're in the building. We're in the, in the business of understanding the city, making people to want a better city, and making people aware of of what the problems or issues are. Not that we have to be very pedagogical, political, but because that's what happens if you get a greater awareness of how things are. So I think we're, we're actually building a, an urban citizenship. We're developing an urban citizenship, which actually gives people the possibility to explore and to try to understand, but also fantasize about what might be, about what might be, what this, what this place might be. And before you involve anybody in any kind of, in any kind of uh, urban planning processes and whatever, well, they all come and say, yeah, we want benches, we want the, we want the dog shit cut, uh, you know, troughs, we want the things for the baby cars, and whatever. You know, you have to really lift their vision of what this place could be, what's the potential. So, so we are actually freeing the imagination, <coughs> freeing the imagination, and the right to think, you know, this, this very important phrase of the, 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 the right to the city, which David Harvey, the philosopher, talks a lot about, has written a lot about, talks about the right to the city. The right is not just to use the city, that you have the right to, do, to, to, to the city. It is, your, it is your right, and you have to want it. You have to want to do something. 
And if you look at how, how the thought of urbanists uh, since the, the 90s has moved towards the arts and culture, and how the arts and culture has moved towards urbanism, they're actually, they're actually melting together. A lot of the phrases being used, a lot of the phrases being used, a lot of the terminology being used, are being borrowed from each other. So this is an, this is a, that's the second half of the talk. But you're going, I think, aren't you? Sorry? Are you going? Sorry? Are you going now? No. Oh, okay. I was, I was, I was, I was just trying to give you a summary. Okay. No, so what this is very really interesting. I mean, yeah. for me, this is super interesting. I'm not... Okay. Let's see if you can go next door and leave the other suit. Yeah. <laughs> But this is definitely something I, yeah. I feel the same, I mean, because we explored the city and opened it up for events. Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, right. Short break, five minutes? Yeah. Okay. <laughs>